conclusion we've come to from that is that there's a significant spherical aberration that appears to be present in the optics and that we should be able to fix it in our insurance program. So when we were on the first service mission, that was like make it or break it. You know, if we didn't get it going, get it fixed, it was not good for NASA. There was talk about it being make or break it for the International Space Station. If you can't fix a telescope, you can't build a space station. You know, vitally important that we do what had to be done and, and get it done. Lift off. Lift off of the Space Shuttle Endeavor on an ambitious mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. The hard part of getting ready to launch is saying goodbye to your family. So we went in quarantine a week before flight, couldn't see our children after that point, could see our spouses up till the day before. But once you said goodbye, for me it was like being on autopilot. You know, I trained to do this, I'm going to do this. And I remember standing out on the launch tower and looking around at the ocean and, and the beach and all that, trying to soak it up and thinking, I wonder if this is my last day on Earth. You know, it just kind of matter-of-factly because somebody's going to get hurt, but probably not me and probably not today. At liftoff, is, is not some, like somebody kicks you in the back. It's more like this firm, unrelenting push that starts up. There's a lot of vibrations in the first stage when the solids were still burning. And then uh, after they separated, it gets really smooth, like an electric cart ride. Acceleration builds up to like 3 Gs toward the end of ascent, so you feel heavy smashed into your seat. And then when the main engine's cut off, you go from like having a gorilla sitting on your chest to everything floats like in a heartbeat. That, that's kind of a magical moment. You go, wow, we're here. I think most um, people, when they first stick their head out to do a spacewalk, the overwhelming feeling or thought is, please God, don't let me screw this up. Because the whole world is watching. Everything you say is on air to ground. And I've got to go. It's uh, Theta Slew and KT. You doing that? No, I'm not touching it. Okay, let me get it stabilized. <laughs> you have to mind language and not say things you don't want your mother to hear. You got uh, the handle in it? No, the handle in it, I'll hold it. Okay, hold it still. It's loose. It's not that you're going to get hurt, it's that you'll mess up something. Because it's, it's just so important to get it right. Well, the time goes by so fast, even though we're moving excruciatingly slowly. And if you're watching this on video, you, you know, fall asleep in the middle of it. But to us, the time just went by in really, really fast. I think we melded really well. I mean, everybody had their job to do, and they knew that. Everybody was cross-trained. We went out into the cargo bay to do a spacewalk. We had all the tools we needed to do any task assigned to the whole mission, not just the one for our, to our day. So if we got in trouble with something, we could drop that, and we'd go do something else and still be productive. So we did an enormous amount of cross-training and everything. On the day that you go out to roll up the solar panels, the old ones, they don't roll up. He said you got, uh, or several people have said you got several options of things you can do. What, uh, what can you do if those pesky solar panels don't work again as you try to retract them? If they don't retract, then our plan is to uh, put a grapple fixture on them, let the arm grab them and, and hold them overboard out of our way, and we'll install the new solar arrays. When, when theirs are checked out, then we'll jettison the old ones. The way the solar rays are supposed to roll up, and they had to for us to bring them home because we had a place for them just to be stowed, and if they didn't fit there, we couldn't bring them home. And so the, the way they operate is that the by stems, the support on the side that extends it and pulls it back, is like two pieces of metal that curl up on itself when you extend it out of the canister, like a metal tape measure. So one curls one way, the other curls around it. So that was the by stem. So when we went to retract the one that didn't roll up, we could see that one piece of that by stem was longer than the other. Somehow it had slipped. The, there is a uh, definite kink right at the upper edge of the second panel there, as you can uh, see in the max part of the bend. We knew by looking at it at that point it was not going to roll up. So we knew the night before that we were going to do a jettison the next day. I was holding it and I just took my hands off of it. And at some point the jet plumes hit it. And it started flapping like this giant bird. And we were over the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, the deserts. I mean, it was like this pterodactyl cruising out there over the deserts. And I had the best view in the universe. It just, it just riveted my attention to it just watching it, and I remember saying, Tom, that looks like a bird. Of the four spacewalkers, we all knew what everybody was doing. 
we, we knew how to do what the guy out there is doing, and so we could maybe see things. Claude Nicolier was incredible on the, on the arm. He would move it and, and sort of relieve stresses and strains that we don't even mention to him. He would just see, you know, well, that looks like it's a little uncomfortable, and he'd just tweak the arm a little bit and, and get you to the right place. And when I was installing CoStar, I was holding it, but the only thing I could see in front of my face was silver. I mean, I, I had no notion of anything going on around me, so my job was to be a rigid body. And he's the one who actually drove that in for the most part. Tom would give me some clues about pitch up, you know, roll a little bit, but mostly it was Claude that the, as long as I stayed rigid, he could put it in there, he could drive it in. And we had clearances that were really small getting in the two guide rails. Every time we stuck in an instrument or did something, the ground would command it and we'd see that power was on and that it was sending data. So before we landed, in fact, by the time we'd finished the fifth spacewalk, we knew that everything that we could do had been done correctly. But then, you know, unless, unless it worked, then nobody was successful. It doesn't matter that what we could do had been done right. If it didn't work, then the whole team was not a success. And so it wasn't quite the let your hair down, celebrate when we got home. That, that didn't happen until after we saw the images in January coming back. The images are incredibly gorgeous. They're just, they're art. They're just beauty. And, and I just sort of revel in that every time I get to see one, even now. They're just amazing. Hubble, I think, was the most incredible invention since Galileo and the telescope, as far as astronomy and astrophysics. Hubble has generated data that generations of scientists are going to be still looking at, still analyzing. It's just generated tons and tons of stuff. More discoveries will be made after Hubble's done because the data will still be there. I, I feel personally connected to the Hubble because my oldest daughter was 11 years old when we launched on that and she got her PhD in astrophysics using Hubble data. Her dissertation director got his PhD using Hubble data and dedicated his dissertation to the astronauts who fixed Hubble. So I, I feel like it's partly mine. Okay, KT. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, they say you got to go for release. They expect 20 pulses on your ice cream. Oh, in the hands. And there's going to be 20 pulses on your ice cream for a set burn. Okay. Look how stable you left that. Okay, 